Welcome everyone to the March webinar of the Liverpool Dimension Ageing Research Forum. Today we've got two presenters who will be talking about post-diagnostic care for dementia. We've got Jeanette Hock, who is Lead Admiral Nurse from the Isle of Man, and we also have Emma Stafford, who is an occupational therapist, and she is the manager of the Dementia Care Navigator Service from Liverpool and Kirkby. So we'll really want to try and understand as well what do Admiral nurses do and what do dementia care navigators do? So first of all, we'll hear from Jeanette. But before that, if you want to follow us on social media as well, as always, you can use the hashtag Liverpool Dementia because we'll be posting throughout as well some updates about the talk and, and you can engage with us a little bit more. And if you have any questions throughout the talks, please just post them in the Q&A. We'll be picking them up afterwards again. So there'll be plenty of time to ask Jeanette and Emma any questions you might have and find out more about what care could be available to you possibly as well. So without further ado, um, our first presenter, Jeanette, lovely to have you here and over to you. Looking forward to hearing about your service. And as usual, you're on mute. Um. My, uh, <laughs> yes, there we go. And you're on mute again. Sorry, Jeanette. That should work now. We're off. OK, sorry about that, everyone. It was just uh, it seemed to it froze on my screen and I couldn't get it um, to unmute me there. So I'm Jeanette Hogg, so I'm a lead admiral nurse at Hospice Isle of Man. And um, thank you all for coming to listen today. So the service on the Isle of Man, which I'm going to talk through a little bit more, um, it's comprised of myself, who's the lead, and I've got a band six admiral nurse with me as well, Chris. Um, so our service was set up by the Forget Me Not charity, um, which is the logo in the middle at the top. They were a group of ladies, five ladies who had um, had a personal experience of dementia and decided to set up a small charity to fund an Admiral Nurse service on the Isle of Man. So that was back in 2018 um, and they basically set up the fundraising and got involved with hospice. So hospice is my host organisation. Um, so I sit within the hospice team, but it means that I've got access to hospice support services and things like that. Um, and all my training and you know development comes from Dementia UK, so that's why I've got the three the three logos. It's like having three bosses. Um, and as long as they all agree, it's great. And when they don't, it causes me a few problems. Um, so that's just to give you a little bit of uh, context, really. So next slide, next slide, please, Debbie. Okay. So I'm not sure if people have heard what an animal nurse is um, or what we do. So. We're basically um, like a like a Macmillan nurse, but for people with dementia and their families. Um, we were named after the family of Joseph Levy, Levy um, who founded the charity. And Joseph had uh, vascular dementia and loved sailing. So the Admiral Nurse term came about from that, really. Um, and they set up the charity, I think it's uh, about 15, 20 years ago now. Um, we work together with families to provide one-to-one -one support and expert guidance and practical solutions just to help people live more positively with, with dementia every day. I've got me somebody else's teeth in today. That's no good, is it? Um, we overall in the UK, we work in places like community, acute trusts, care homes, hospices, um, GP surgeries and prisons. And over on the Isle of Man, um, we are community based and we were based at hospice. Um, and there's a link at the bottom there. What does an Admiral nurse do? And what I'll do is I'll post that into the chat function later so that you can have a little look at the animation that comes from Dementia UK. So there's um, 312 Admiral nurses in the whole of the UK um, and 20 work in hospice settings, including myself and Chris. So we're quite specialised in what we do. OK, so next slide, please, Debbie. Thank you. OK, so just looking at the sort of overall Admiral nurse model, um, so this is what we call the tiered model, the ABC approach. Um, so we're all registered nurses and um, we all have either a background in general nursing or a background in mental health nursing. And we specialise in dementia care and working with families and people who are affected by dementia, particularly during complex periods of transition. And we do this through a variety of ways, whether it be through casework or coordination, 
um, groups, you know, clinics. Um, and our remit is about promoting physical, social, psychological and spiritual health, family carers and people with dementia. Um, it's about improving well-being and quality of life for people with dementia and their family carers and sort of enhancing adjust, adjustment and coping strategies for people affected by dementia and their families. So the bottom tier of the pyramid, the advice section, um, this is where the, like the Alzheimer's Society would sit and crossroads for carers, live at home schemes would sit at the bottom. And um, the middle tier would be um, support workers. So for example, old persons mental health services um, and we sit at the top tier um, and admiral nurses. Um, and then running alongside that, we have the best practice as well. So the bottom tier can be anything from informal conversations with somebody in the corridor or in the streets, you know, about, oh, I'm not sure where to go with this or um, where do I, you know, how can I support my loved one or is what's available? So it can be anything sort of informal like that. The middle tier would cover um, compassionate communities and things like integrated care teams and, and that supportive best practice. And the top tier, we're hoping to work to being a dementia friendly island. Um, you know, we've already started doing some work with some of the supermarkets and the banks to make the aisles. Say, for example, in Tesco, we've got a trade allure aisle, which is a time enough aisle. So it's like a slower aisle for people who've got um, hidden disabilities, for people with dementia, so that they can still maintain their independence. But it's about supporting them in like normal environments like supermarkets and banks. So we're working towards getting a lot more services and, um, you know, banks, the sort of police force, ambulance crews, those types of things all trained up for dementia friends so that we can become a dementia friendly island eventually. OK, so next slide, please, Eddie. Okay, so just just in case anyone doesn't know where the Isle of Man is um, and just to give you again a little bit of context, so on the sort of map, if you kind of drew a line between Cumbria and Belfast, we're, we're that sort of dot in the middle of the sea, really. Um, we've only got a population of 85,000 people, so we're, we're like a large town in effect. We're just stuck in the middle of the sea. Uh, we're quite rural um, the biggest town is 25,000 people. And on the Isle of Man, there's about 1400 people with a dementia diagnosis. Um, but we do have a higher than average um, number of elderly people living on the Isle of Man because a lot of people were encouraged to come and retire over here. Um, and people don't always have family support on the island as well. A lot of family members tend to be in the UK or further afield. Um, so it does make it a little bit more complex in that respect. Um, so it's just to give you a little bit of context about uh, the overall Admiral Nurse Service and obviously where the Isle of Man is and, and some of the statistics. So next slide, please, Debbie. Thank you. So when I was setting the service up, um, I sort of looked at what was the existing um, service provision that was available on the island. I kind of scoped everything out just to see where the support was and how the service needed to sit and where about it needed to sit. Um, and what I found was the person with dementia, um, once they have the diagnosis, they're quite well supported. So for the first sort of 12 or 18 months post diagnosis, there's a lot of support from the Alzheimer's Society, from the older person's mental health teams. And then after that sort of 12 or 18 months, they, people seem to go to like six monthly visits. And a lot of that was around the memory clinic assessments. Um, and then there was nothing really sort of for people who had um, mid stage dementia to sort of advanced dementia. Um, so looking at the service and the carer support was quite patchy as well um, and the big majority of what I do is supporting carers so it was about working out where was the best place to start the service um, and for me it was that sort of midpoint really and um, so myself and Chris pick up people from mid to end stages of dementia and what I found with the advanced dementia is that again it was very patchy the support that people got at end of life for people living with dementia it was very very patchy I think hospice historically, um, I think we've maybe had about 25 people through the door who we'd supported at end of life, but that was usually because they had a cancer diagnosis alongside the dementia diagnosis. Um, so again, the support was quite patchy for end of life care. So it made sense to sit the service sort of at that midpoint. And then you, you've actually got quite a nice continuum. You know, you've got older persons, um, mental health services and the Alzheimer's Society up for the first 18 months. And then we sort of pick them up from that point until end of life. 
um, and we also support um, carers post bereavement as well um, and it kind of it, it sits quite nicely so we've got a nice whole continuum there um, and the bulk of our caseload is actually the carers who require support um, in managing the behavioural symptoms of the loved one's dementia and we'll come on to that a little bit more later on. Okay so next slide please. Um, so how the service works on the island uh, we work closely with, the, with all the sectors um, and it's an open referral process. So what this means is that anybody can refer in. Um, it doesn't have necessarily have to be a health professional. So within hospice, um, we've accepted referrals from other departments. Um, you know, for example, the clinical nurse specialists have referred in. We've had a referral from the social work team within hospice. Um, and because we are based in hospice, we can access the hospice services, which again, I'll, I'll come on to a little bit later on. Um, in terms of the community side, we work very closely with Compassionate Isle of Man. Um, we have some specially trained volunteers at hospice, um, the Compassionate Isle of Man volunteers, who um, support people in the community, in their own homes, um, and offer some community respite. So it may be that they go in every Tuesday afternoon for a period of six weeks, you know, for a couple of hours, just to give that carer a bit of a break um, and keep that, you know, keep the loved one at home. And it just means the carer can go and meet their own health needs or, you know, there's the somebody sat with their loved one so that they're not worried about leaving them. Um, so community referrals can come through from district nurses, long term conditions coordinators, GPs. Um, we have referrals from Manx Care, so that's our, um, you know, acute trust or the, the care, health, and health, health and care services on the island. Um, and we've had referrals through from older persons mental health, the hospital, social workers, the integrated care teams. Um, carers can self-refer to us as well, which I think is a little bit unusual because usually it has to be a health professional. Um, and we do take referrals from the third sector, so the Alzheimer's Society or Crossroads for Carers, places like that. We'll take referrals from those as well. OK, so next slide, please. Thank you. So the service delivery is kind of split into five key areas. Um, so my my figures are the first figures, and then Chris's figures are the figures in brackets, and I'll talk through each area in a little bit more detail. Um, so we have our active caseload, which is our one to one support. We have group interventions. We have um, consultancy and training within hospice and consultancy and training external to hospice and then service development. Um, and I'll just talk through each element as I go through the slides. Next slide, please, Debbie. I'll just grab it. <clears throat> so I developed a um, hub and spoke model for the service. And again, I'll go through these pieces in a lot more detail on the following slides. But the your time, your place is kind of the hub um, aspect. And this is a dementia wellbeing group for carers and people with dementia. Um, it's eight weekly sessions and we started that in March this year. And I'll, I'll go into a bit more detail with that a bit further on. Um, the one-to-one -one support with carers commenced in July last year. The clinics have finally started um, running again. Um, and we'd link the clinics in with the dementia um, cafes, the decafs. So they're, uh, they're every month, uh, once a month in different locations on the island um, and myself or Chris all attend. We, you know, we'll sort of meet with some of the carers. We can do some one to one support with the carers at that time. And it's just a, a good way of um, reaching more people. Um, so because of the ruralness of the Isle of Man, you know, I mean, the furthest point away is probably, you know, 45 minute drive. It's not a huge drive away, but you know, if you've got somebody who's up the north of the island, 45 minutes there, 45 minutes back, by the, you know, by the time you've done your visit as well, that's half your day gone. Whereas if I go to the decaf clinic, I can maybe speak to two or three people in the same amount of time. So it's just a better re use of our resources, but means we can reach more people. Um, the informal network is going to start after the group interventions and I'll come to that a bit later on. And the Moving Forward programme um, will be starting later this year to support carers for post bereavement. Um, so on our caseload, we do have the people with dementia and the carers. Um, we do advance care plans for both of them because um, it's really important that the carer has something in place in case they die first. And obviously it's really important to get the care plans in place for the person with dementia while we've still got that capacity and that window to do so. 
Um, we do support people obviously once they come to end of life as well. Um, and we support the carers post bereavement as well. Okay, so next slide please. So just to give you an idea of um, current caseload to date. So the service opened up um, on the 1st of June last year and we started taking um, the referrals from the 12th of July. So these figures are up to the end of February. So I have a smaller caseload than Chris because I have a lot of the, um, the grown up stuff to do, um, as I call it, which is where, you know, all the service development and developing the training programmes and things like that. So at the moment, we've got 45 families that are currently active um, and we, we do it as we count it as a family unit. So the family unit might have one person with dementia and one carer. It might be one person with dementia and two carers, you know, like two daughters or two sons. We've also got a couple of families who have got one carer, but they're supporting two people. So they could be supporting their husband and their mother-in-law. We've both got different types of dementia. So we kind of count it as a family unit. So we have 45 currently active um, and we've supported and discharged 19 families over the last um, seven months. So 62 families supported in total over the last six or seven months. And what we tend to do is we'll go out, we'll do an initial assessment with people. Um, it tends to be what we call the great outpouring because usually it's the first time that somebody has asked that carer and how are you? And what we tend to find is people have tears and, and all sorts because nobody's actually ever spent the time and asked them how they're getting on. It tends to be focused very much around the people with dementia and, you know, and managing their medication, for example. And, putting some you know, equipment in place for the person with dementia, but nobody ever seems to ask the carers how they are. Um, so we usually have that sort of great outpouring for the first visit. Um, and then we usually say about six sessions on average, and that's determined by the carers needs really. So the sessions could be weekly, they could be two weekly, they could be monthly. It depends on what the needs are. Um, and we, we say to people at the beginning, you know, we'll give you the sort of six sessions. If you need more sessions, that's absolutely fine. Some people only need three or four. Some people were up to about eight or nine sessions. It just depends on their needs at the time. And then once things are more stable, we tend to discharge them. So we kind of think of the, um, if you think of the person with dementia and the carer as a tower, you can't, it's very hard to do this visually, but like a tower. And sometimes the tower starts to tip over a little bit. So myself and Chris will come along and we'll prop the tower back up and we'll put some scaffolding around it. Um, and once things are stable again, we'll discharge them from the system, but they can always re-refer back in. If things change and the tower starts to fall over again, we can always put them back onto the system and, and put them back onto the caseload. So it, it's that's why we have the active families and then the inactive families. Um, and just to give you an idea of where some of the referrals have come from, um, so we've, like I said, we've had referrals from long term condition coordinators, uh, GPs, older persons mental health service, carers themselves, uh, clinical nurse team, speech and language therapy, uh, dietitian, adult health visitor and the WWP is the Western Wellbeing Partnership. It's one of our integrated um, care hubs on the Isle of Man, um, which they're, they, we've got three now and they're just looking to develop the fourth one. Um, so again, that's that's bringing all sort of key partners together in one place using one referral form um, and, you know, making sure that everyone's working together around the person rather than several people being involved and having several forms to fill in. So we're getting start to get referrals in from them as well. Um, so next slide, please. <clears throat> so today from July um, to February, um, we've undertaken 149 visits between the two of us and 324 contact hours. Um, and just to give you an idea of some of the, the topics that we're helping carers, you know, supporting carers with. Um, so as you can see, agitation is quite a big one there. Um, hallucinations, depression, the, you know, the seven stages of dementia. Quite often people like to know where their loved one is up to. Um, what kind of things to expect in the future, um, you know, and it's almost like we have a checklist that we go through and we kind of say to people, well, you know, this is where they are now. They might be stage six. If you start to see some of these areas, um, you know, appearing, this might be that they're moving into stage seven, um, you know, so that just gives you an idea of some of the, the things that we're helping carers to deal with. And I think the biggest thing that we can give carers is time. Um, so we give people time to talk time for us to listen, time for people to air their worries and explore how they're feeling. And 
quite often the carers will say to us that you know you're the first person that's actually really listened um, and really given us that time you know and we know that that first visit can take two hours and that's fine you know we, we tend to if we have our first assessment visit we tend not to book anything else in for the rest of the day because we've learned from experience that we could be there for two hours because that person just needs to completely vent how they're feeling and that's absolutely fine and we do have the luxury of doing that and I think that makes us quite different to all the specialist nurses where they're sometimes rushing from one person to the next and you know Dementia UK are very very keen that the time is the real is the real thing for us you know that we're able to spend that time with the carers um, so next slide please thank you so that's all the um the sort of one-to-one -one support if you like um so the group interventions we've started these in march this is just the um the leaflets that we've sent out really just to, to give you an idea and obviously there's a picture of me and chris we're not we're not the old couple at the front we're the ones in the middle by the banner just in case anyone was wondering um but it just this is just the leaflet that we've sent out to the community about the group interventions and i'll just go through a little bit more what they're about uh, next slide please Debbie. Thank you. So the group interventions, um, like I say, we've set them up in March this year. We started on the 7th of March. I've been trying to get them up and running for about six months, but because of COVID restrictions, we kept cancelling. Um, and what we've had to do is we've had to run them with smaller numbers now. Um, the original plan was we were going to run it with um, 10 people with dementia and 10 carers, and we were going to do the eight sessions um, and then sort of regroup have an evaluation, review it, and then run the next cohort. But because of the COVID restrictions in terms of how many people we can have in the hospice building, we've actually started it with um, four couples. So we've got four people with dementia and four, four of their loved ones with them. Um, so there's eight sessions. Um, the first session for the people with dementia, so everyone comes in, we do chair-based exercise together. Um, so that's the staff, the volunteers, um, people with dementia, the carers. So we all, we all sit and do about 20 minutes of chair-based exercise with a little bit of music, um, which has been really, it's been quite good fun actually doing that. Um, and then we split the two groups out. So the people with dementia are supported by Chris. We have a um, creative arts coordinator at hospice, social work assistant, and some specially trained volunteers. Um, and we are sort of top heavy on the staff because it means that we can actually give people one-to-one -one support if they don't want to take part in the group activities that's fine we can take them off to the side and do some one-to-one -one support work with them um, so we do the first session is just this is me it's just about getting to know the person with dementia um, and then the topics each week we've had seaside topics sporting memories um, reminiscence like last week we had the um, lady from the family library come in and she's got all artifacts from the Isle of Man in sort of years gone by and she brought that in and that was quite good for discussion. Um, the sporting memories, they were sat there with um, some non-alcoholic beer watching the 1966 World Cup, you know. Um, so we try, we try and involve a lot of the senses. The seaside one, they had some ice creams as well as doing some shell painting and some craft work. We've got pause for therapy coming in um, for the pet session. We've got a music session, um, a school days and then the last session is wellbeing. Um, and when people come in, we kind of do a little evaluation with them, like just a visual analogue scale, just to see how they're feeling before the session, and then we capture it again at the end. Um, so that's the sessions for the people living with dementia. Um, so next slide, please, Debbie. Thank you. Um, so the group interventions for the carers. So once the, we split off after the chair-based exercise, I actually take the carers um, to a separate training room and do some sort of bespoke training with them. Um, so again, the first one was just an introduction. It was just for people to sort of get to know each other. Um, so far, we've looked at behavioural and psychological symptoms of dementia, communication and unmet need. Um, we had a session with a speech and language therapist last week on eating and drinking, and that was eating and drinking right the way through a dementia as it progresses and up to, up to the end of life. Um, next week, we've got advanced care plans. And then I've got a session on um, care of grief and care of, gri care of grief and guilt. That's easier to write than it is to um, speak. Um, and that's going to be delivered by one of our psychology team. Um, managing care of stress and resilience. That's going to be delivered by our senior occupational therapist. And then the last session again is wellbeing session. So we've got some mindfulness. We've got some massage from, um, you know, some Reiki from the complementary therapy team. 
and again that's all evaluated at the beginning and the end so the start of the sessions and um, we do like a baseline evaluation just to see how confident people are and what knowledge they have and um, we do a carer stress scale and also um, the Warwick and Edinburgh mental well-being scale just to see how the well-being is and then at the end of the sessions um, we do the, at the end of the eight weeks we do that again just to see if the group interventions have made a difference and what I've found so far I've just I've just put some feedback um, out to the staff and the volunteers just to see how they think things were going for the first four sessions um, and we're getting some really positive feedback from the people with dementia they actually really like coming when one of their loved ones said oh you know you're going to your club today they were like oh I like going there so they were they were really excited about that and the carers are already starting to, start to bond and sort of support each other um, you know I think for them I think they've had so much isolation over the last two years with Covid that I think for them to be able to talk to somebody in the same room who's actually going through the same stuff that they're going through and who understands it they've already said after four sessions this is really good this is really helpful you know I'm not on my own there's people who understand it and it, that's just given them that real boost and a real support in their confidence um, so yeah so that, that that's sort of up and running and finally after six months of like stop start stop start we finally got those up and running in the March and um, so that's the group sessions and um, so next slide please Debbie thank you so part of my role as well is um, training and consultancy and the reason it's such a key part of my role is that if we deliver training to people and get people to understand things from the point of view from the person with dementia it should result in a better experience for people living with dementia when they come into contact with hospice services and um, you know and they can be properly supported by hospice staff um, when they come in and um, for whether it be the group sessions or whether it be because they're coming to end of life it's just making sure that they're properly supported so it's spreading that knowledge that myself and Chris have um, so within um, the hospice I've supported I've trained people around what the actual animal nurse service is very similar to what I'm doing today um, you know and how it works we've looked at um, module one person centered care which is an overview of types of dementia risk factors and this is delivered to staff and volunteers and it's ongoing um, you know as we get new people coming in um, and obviously the particularly the volunteers because they support people in the community uh, module two is um, person-centred care communication on that need so again that's an ongoing rolling program uh, the module three is um, a module I'm hoping to develop later this year around palliative dementia care and what dementia looks like at end of life um, and really this is to support my palliative colleagues who have got a lot of experience in terms of end of life for cancer and end of life for um, organ failure but not so much knowledge and experience around end of life for dementia which looks very different so that's going to be developed later this year um, and the other aspect of that is the environmental side so we had a, a refurbishment in hospice um, a couple of years ago it took a little bit longer than anticipated because of covid because um, obviously everything came to a stop didn't it but it, it's about things like um, you know proper signage around the hospice um, grab rails and contrasting colours you know toilet seats that are in contrasting colours proper signage those kind of things so that's all the internal training um, so next slide please Debbie. Jeanette I'm mindful we're running out of time and we've got another key speaker here so is it okay if you wrap up in a minute please and then we go yeah, over no to problem. Emma no thank problem. you I tell you what, we'll just go quickly. Um, if you just want to the next slide, because that's very similar to the external. Um, so just to give you an idea of training delivered. Um, you know, we've delivered training to 252 people since July, um, and 49 and a half training hours. Um, and this includes things like this as well. And then just if we move on to the next slide, please, Debbie. So the, and the last aspect of my role is the service development. Um, so things like the steering groups, we have quarterly meetings with key partners where I update them on the service um, and that's all about partnership working and you know working on external events like we've got, we're doing some dementia action week um, and then the evaluation is a big part of it as well so we've got a research team at hospice um, and it's just about making sure that we capture the, the evaluations and the feedback for the one-to-one -one support, the group interventions, the training um you know and things like getting things published and having that sort of best practice ethos to make sure that we are moving towards a dementia friendly island um, and i think that's pretty much it if you want to just go to the next slide and um, the service development this is just we are supported by dementia uk 
um, and we have um, a number of things that are protected um, study time for us. So we have a community practice, which is hospice admiral nurses. We have our annual forum. We have clinical supervision, which is the PALS group. Um, so we are fully supported to support the carers and people with dementia. And that is it, promise. Great. Thank you so much, Jeanette. That's great. And there'll be uh, some questions as well. So if you have any questions for Jeanette, pop them in the chat. We'll answer them afterwards. OK, um, thank you, Jeanette. Uh, back to you afterwards, but now over to Emma, um, who is leading the Dementia Care Navigator Service in Liverpool and Kirkby. Over to you, Emma. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm Emma Stafford. Um, by background, I'm an occupational therapist um, and I'm currently a deputy manager in the CMHT, but part of my role is to also manage um, the Care Navigator Service. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the Dementia Care Navigator Service that covers Liverpool and Kirby. So if we could have the first slide. Thank you. OK, so I'm going to give you an outline of what the service is, how it came about, um, our aims and objectives, and, and I suppose what our plans are really going forward. OK, so can I have the next slide? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so why Dementia Care Navigators? So as you're probably all aware, a number of years ago, there was a really important document, the National Dementia Strategy. Um, and within this, one of the um, kind of main points it explained was about the need for dementia advisors, um, which we've obviously given our um, care navigators a slightly different title, but that is where, where the initial idea came from. And it also came from the fact that people with dementia highlighted um, and carers did that they felt they needed someone who was a continuous support so right throughout their journey and um, because I think a lot of other services come and go so you know somebody might have a community nurse when things are particularly difficult or they might have some input from OT or psychology but I think people dip in, in and out and their, their feeling was they wanted somebody always there. I think also, you know, um, sort of in recent years, there's been a lot of work in Liverpool around developing something called the clinical network, which is where people receive their diagnosis of dementia. So that can be with ourselves in Mersey Care, or it can be also in the Walton Centre or in the Royal and Board Green, and they all we all come under the dementia clinical network. And so what we also wanted to make sure is that wherever anybody was diagnosed in Liverpool, they receive the same equitable service and the care navigator role is part of that. So, you know, if you're diagnosed in any of the, those four places, then you are entitled to accessing the care navigator service. Um, and I suppose that's the final point really on there. It's just saying it, it has helped with services becoming more equitable for people with dementia across, across the patch. OK, so could I have the next slide, please? OK, so I've just explained why, how it came about, um, but now I'm going to talk a little bit about what it actually is, because um, I know Clarissa and I were talking a little earlier that actually across sort of the country, it varies quite a lot in you know, how it's interpreted the role and how it's rolled out and managed and different things. Um, so in Liverpool and Kirby, it sits within the memory and community mental health team model. So we sit in the offices with the CMHT. Um, and it's a service that provides support to anyone with a diagnosis of dementia um, or and who is caring for a person with dementia. And the person must also have a Liverpool or a Kirby GP. And that's regardless of however old they are or the type of dementia. So, you know, it's just those those two things really. They they need to have a Liverpool or Kirby GP and they um, need to have a diagnosis of dementia. And the diagnosis, like I say, can have been made really anywhere. And sometimes we do just get people contacting us saying, my husband, you know, has been diagnosed with dementia a year ago. Um, I've heard about the care navigators. Would would you be entitled to one? So we, we can pick up referrals like that as well. You know, some come through more formal channels, but some do come from people just ringing us up. Um, we don't currently support anyone that is in a care home. So everyone that we work with is at home and that's just about the way the service is funded. 
really. And, you know, obviously that may change, but at the moment that's how it is. Um, our hours of operation are nine to five, Monday to Friday. And <clears throat> at the moment we've got 11 care navigators. So we started off with, I think it was two or three, probably about eight years ago. And then in the last few years, we've, we've steadily grown um, because only recently we've received funding for Kirby um, as well. So, so we've got quite a few really now available to us. And the referrals come by myself and I then allocate them out to the 11 care navigators and, and they make contact with them. Um, could I have the next slide, please? OK, so how can we help? So we have a couple of targets that we have to meet and that's to do with the way we're commissioned. So we have to make contact um, with the person with dementia or the carer within 14 days of receiving the referral. And so we ensure it's quite a timely response because we feel that's really important because, you know, obviously when people have been quite newly diagnosed with dementia, the person and the carer, they, they often need somebody to speak to, you know, quite even if it's initially just a short conversation and then followed up a bit later, you know, with a bit more detail and more information. Um, and then as a minimum, we contact everyone within six months um, but and that's usually initially by phone um, but it can be face to face if needed and we can quite easily visit or contact people more frequently if needed and we just base that on the conversation we're having with the person or the carer and we can step that up or down. Um, we're there for emotional support for the person with dementia and the carer. We are also offer practical advice um, and a big part of the role is about signposting onto other services. Um, so, you know, if, if it's not something we can particularly solve or help, we'll try and find out who we can con put you in contact with. We do a lot of joint working with other services. Um, so services such as the Admiral Nurses within our area, we started to, you know, be more aware of their services and the Alzheimer's Society, social services. Um, also, which is really a really beneficial part of the care navigator role, is that we have direct access back to the CMHT if the if situations escalate. So, um, you know, we might sometimes get a relative ringing up in a crisis situation. So one of the care navigators um, would just speak on the phone and then go out if needed, find out what would help and if necessary, come back and we can pass that case through to the community mental health team. Um, and there's that understanding that that can happen quite easily, really. So it's kind of that if, if the care needs stepping up, we can involve the CMHT again. So that, that works really nicely because it means that somebody doesn't have to go back through their GP. It's quite a smooth process. Um, it's very accessible service, so people can ring in themselves. Um, you know, we always provide a leaflet and an information pack so that people have our details and can ring us. Um, we're there to respond and support in crisis situations. And I suppose, as I've just described, point people in the right direction. The next slide, please. Um, also, we, we offer support and advice around dementia awareness um, and we have done some sessions and um, you know, sort of events in primary care as well um, to, to promote about dementia and about the service. Um, we've recently done quite a lot of work around cross-referencing dementia registers in primary care. So we want to ensure that we're capturing everyone in Liverpool and Kirby um, that have a diagnosis of dementia. And, we, you know, we've been very aware that we haven't had everyone because obviously we know our numbers and we're aware that that might not be the amount that we should have. Um, so we did this big piece of work where we linked in with all the surgeries and cross-referenced the registers and actually found quite a lot more service users um, that we, we can be in contact with. We can help to coordinate services. Um, we can also improve links with primary care for those that are worried about their memory and are not yet diagnosed. 
So I think that's again around the sort of dementia awareness raising and educating um, primary care. Um, and we can support the person with dementia to navigate their own care. So we're there for the person and the carer. Um, and, and I think, you know, like I said earlier, one of the main roles of it is we're always a constant in, in that journey. So from point of diagnosis, you know, as long as the person is living at home, really. OK, so the next slide, please. Coming up a bit differently, that one. <laughs> So right, benefits, OK, so <clears throat> like I said, constant in a person's journey, um, direct access to the CMHT has proved really beneficial um, and it enables the person never to be discharged from the service because I think before we had the care navigators, because I, I was here working in the CMHT before that, and I think that was a real issue that, you know, once someone with dementia was discharged from service, they then had to go back to the GP present the whole case again to get referred again and it's it just makes it very long winded and and challenging really for people. Um, I also think a benefit we've seen is to help avoid crisis situations. So, you know, sometimes what can feel like a crisis to maybe the carer or the person, if they just give us a ring, um, which frequently happens and we can talk that through and point somebody in the right direction, it doesn't really always need to actually reach a crisis or if it does we can escalate it very quickly to CMHT. Um, another real advantage is because I manage one of the CMHTs on the care navigators and I can really see that it allows a lot of throughput for CMHT. So obviously we couldn't keep all our service users open in the community mental health team so this allows um, no one to be lost or discharged, but people can sit with the care navigators and then access the CMHT if and when needed. Um, and it's also just a, a group of staff that are there if somebody isn't sure who to contact. So sometimes we do get queries that possibly don't fit exactly with our service, but we can easily redirect them to the correct place. OK, next one, please. OK. Um, and I suppose just to, I thought it was worth highlighting the challenges. So, you know, I, I would say one of the challenges is the fact that it's a large caseload. Um, you know, so the mo it sort of hovers around 1900, 2000. Um, and so we're dealing with quite large numbers that we need to make sure we, you know, contact everyone. Um, and then in line with that, it's meant that we've got to have really quite comprehensive IT systems to ensure that we're contacting everyone every six months and within the 14 day initial period. So that, although that is all set up now and fine, I would say that that was a bit of a challenge early on. Because um, when I first came into post um, to manage the care navigators, we were working off great big lists, um, printed lists, and it was it, it was very difficult to keep on top of it. So then we worked with our IT department and we managed to set up a system which flags up every six months who needs contacting. So that that now works quite well. Um, I suppose as well, another challenge has been around the funding of posts because it, although we have now got 11, that's taken many years really to get to that. You know, we've kept thinking we were getting more care navigators, then it didn't come off and things. So that's been probably a little bit of a challenge. Um, and also, you know, as when any service starts new, I mean, I'm thinking back to years ago, um, sometimes the acceptance of a new service within kind of the wider um, sort of teams and um, area can be a challenge to begin with. But I think, you know, through promoting the service and working closely with people, we've we've come overcome that. And I think it's one more slide. Okay. And then just really our priorities going forward. So what, what we're looking to build on. So we've already started and have, have been doing for a while um, linking in with GPs, but it's just really about building and securing those relationships and um, you know having regular contact with them. Um, 
Also, we're, we're involved across Liverpool. They have um, integrated care team meetings in primary care, um, which is groups of surgeries that are grouped together to form integrated care teams. And we're now in all of those. So it's just to continue with that. So we offer um, advice around dementia and we pick up referrals through those meetings. We've also recently started to ensure that we, we visit all patients living alone face to face. It's not on the phone. So that's kind of a new development. Um, continue to cross reference our dementia registers and respond in a timely way. And then just two other things which have come about in the last couple of days, actually. So, um, well, one thing and one thing I've just been thinking about today, actually, but um, we, we're starting to try and produce our, some of our care navigator information, our leaflets and things in other languages, um, which is something we, we have looked at before, but is um, something we're going to try and focus on a little bit more. So. Um, trying to look at producing in the um, main languages that are spoken across Liverpool, because obviously that can be a barrier, can't it? So we want to ensure we're capture, capturing everyone um, across the area. So that's something that um, I've had some meetings about in the last couple of days. And also, really, we did evaluate the service a number of years ago um, when it was much smaller. But I think just hearing um, Jeanette talk today and um, it made me think actually that's something we probably need to revisit again quite soon. OK, I think that's everything from me. Thank you so much, Emma, and thank you, Jeanette. That was really interesting. And I think just to kind of highlight again, it's we usually have researchers presenting here or, or sometimes service providers, but I think this particular talk is merely about what kind of post-diagnostic care for dementia is out there. And I think it's nice to kind of understand what do admiral nurses do, what do care navigators do and how they complement one another. So thank you both very much. Really interesting. I've learned a lot more as well, um, although I've spoken to you before. So if anyone has any questions, we've got about 10 minutes time for Q&A. So I see some posted already, but please feel free to add your questions further. Um, so one question um, was initially posted for Jeanette, but I think it can refer to both of you actually, both Jeanette and Emma. So Robert McDonald is asking, I understand that people living with dementia would, if possible, prefer to live at home with their families. What are your practical suggestions for making home a dementia friendly space and place and making that possible. So maybe Jeanette from an Admiral Nurse point of view. Still unmuting. Yeah, I would probably say um, so we do a um, we do we do home visits um, with people, and a, one of the things we look at is the environment. So we, we things like um, making sure they've got the right equipment in place. So we contact the OTs, make sure that they've got the equipment that they need to support them. But it can be things like um, signage on cupboards, you know, signage on the bathroom door. It can be things like um, contrasting toilet seats and handrails so people can actually find the toilet. Um, you know, and there are, I, I would usually sort of direct them as well, there's the SCIE website, um, the Social Care Institute of Excellence. I've got a whole um, section on environment um, and there's some really, really good videos and practical tips on there as well. So I would usually um, email people that link as well so they can have a look at it and see what would work in their home and then meet back with them and talk through some of the things that they've, you know, they've seen on the videos as well. Because um, it is, it's really important to keep people at home as long as we possibly can, and a lot of the time it is changing that environment, um, you know, to help that person stay independent and stay at home. Really. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And what about uh, from your point of view, Emma? I think I'd probably just echo a lot of what Jeanette has just said, and and I think the care navigators would probably go out gather um, information, what the, you know, generally what the issues are. And then, as Janessa said, would probably signpost on to an OT um, to do a more in-depth assessment around um, practical things in the home. And again, like Jeanette said, that would involve 
signs, reminders, uh, other equipment and things, memory aids, that type of thing. So, yeah, I think it's just about making sure you get the correct assessment, isn't it? Um, yeah. And I think when thinking about how both the Admiral Nurse sides of things work and dementia can navigate to uh, services work, Admiral nurses seem to be more similar, don't they, across the country, whereas having, and, and Emma, you and I had that chat before as well, that the, the care navigator services seem very patchy, and my research has shown that as well. Some people don't even know about care navigators. Do you have any thoughts on that, maybe how it is across the country, Emma? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I probably realised it varied as much as it does until we'd spoken um, and I think definitely that would be something that would be really interesting for us as a service to look into actually you know how are the other um, services operating. I suppose it, I don't I think in the dementia strategy it probably doesn't give detailed clear kind of guidance on actually how those services had to look so I suppose it's fitting it into what else is already in your area um, and I think maybe that's what shaped it a little bit for us in Liverpool because I'm probably in, in the other areas you're talking about like Manchester and Newcastle I think you've got to look at what else there is around you because I know what we started to notice recently is that there is a few services that are kind of quite similar and we you know there is a bit of overlap say with our Admiral nurses we're not exactly the same at all but there is overlap so it's trying to work out what's your bit isn't it so that we're not all trying to do the same thing and and maybe just from me as a listener as well to kind of summarize the key differences and and um correct me if i'm wrong but really dementia care navigators are non-medically qualified yeah professionals um, who, who are there to really signpost to important services who are there to provide emotional support for the person with the condition and the person caring for someone but also that practical advice with forms and, and documents isn't yeah. it yeah 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 and and then yeah. we have the admiral nurses side who are medically qualified nurses who can support for example as you were saying with agitation and, and aggression and behavioral issues and you're providing support one-on-one -on -one support and group support isn't it so more in-depth support that you provide Jeanette it's is it unmuted it keeps sticking sorry no, yeah, we can hear you. Sticks. Um, yeah we, we tend to be um, we tend to deal with the more sort of complex cases as well and um, so the dementia care navigator sounds very similar to the dementia support workers that the Alzheimer's Society have it's very, it sounds like a very similar role, role in terms of caseload management and then we tend to pick up the more complex cases, um, you know, whether there might be multiple issues going on rather than just, you know, one sort of particular issue. Um, and I think the, the beauty for us, just touching on what you're saying about how patchy it can be for the dementia care navigators, is that we're all trained the same way. We're all trained by Dementia UK. So you could potentially, we have a helpline for people that they can ring, um, the 0800 number, which is on my last slide. but. If you spoke to anybody on the helpline, you would get the same advice as if you spoke to me in person. Um, and they have regional clinics now as well and close to home. Yeah, so they're, they're, everyone's trained the same way. And because I think we have the protected monthly supervision, um, you know, we all we come together as a group, um, small groups, and we, you know, we'll reflect on case studies and things like that. And you're, we're all coming up with the same sort of solutions. We're all thinking the same way, which is really helpful. Um, thank you. So I wasn't uh, wrong, so I picked that up correctly. Um, but it's, it's good, I think, to have both of you on to really highlight how you complement one another as well. And maybe just to pick up a comment from Peter Lloyd. Um, so com compliments to the services you provide, both excellent models, um, but also very staff and time intensive. Mm. I suppose a, a general question that no one can answer, but how many staff are needed to scale these services up across a nation? Now we have around 900, 920,000 people with dementia estimated across the UK. Um, especially as you were saying, Emma, it took years to get 11 care yes. navigators into Mercy Care. So, yeah. so 
it seems that all the questions we have, there's a few more um, queries about contacts and sending links and email addresses to both of you, Jeanette and Emma, so we'll forward them afterwards. But I think, thank you both for your talks. Um, that's been really great. And we'll publish the talk afterwards on our YouTube channel as well. And just to give a little bit of a shout out for the next webinar, which will take place. Oh, can you go back, Debbie, please? Thank you. Um, the next webinar will take place during Dementia Action Week on the 18th of May from 1 till 2. And we'll have a final year declin trainee, Francesi, from the University of Liverpool. And she's done a research project as part of her doctorate in clinical psychology, looking at sexuality and relationships in care homes and what might be the staff experiences and training needs so we'll hear from Fran and I've also posted the link in the q and um, I'm hoping to see you then. Thank you everyone for joining. Bye now.